Welcome everybody to another episode. I am sitting here today with retired Master Sergeant Stacy Munoz. Stacy Munoz served in the United States Army, culminating a 24 year career. She enlisted in the United States Army in 1998, directly following her 18th birthday. She served six years on active duty in the regular army and then transferred to the Army Reserves. About six months into the Army Reserves, Master Sergeant Munoz was picked up as an AGR or active guard reservist. During her service, she's held multiple positions throughout human resources, operations, training, and leadership. Uh, some assignments include air defense artillery assignments at Fort Bliss, uh, the MEPS, or the Military Entrance Processing Station in Seattle, Washington, the 70th RRC, or Regional Readiness Command in Fort Lawton, Washington, the 84th Training Command and Human Resources Command at Fort Knox, and the United States Army Reserve Command, or as we like to call it, USARC, at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. She's deployed with the 3rd Expeditionary Sustainment Command to Iraq in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom for 15 months. Her military education includes, of course, basic training and all of the wonderful NCO courses along the way. Uh, she's also attended Airborne School, uh, Modern Army Combatives Level 1, Master Fitness Course, Master Resilience Trainer Course Levels 1 through 3, Protocol courses levels one through four, and her civilian education includes an associate degrees in exercise science, focusing on nutrition and personal training from International Sports Science Association. Stacy's greatest passion is serving and teaching others coping and adaptability skills while educating and supporting mental health and wellness programs. She is also the vice president of education for the Toastmasters Club of Sand Hills, where she schedules member speeches and projects and serves as a resource for questions about education awards, speech contests, and the mentor program. Uh, for those who don't know, Toastmasters International is a nonprofit educational organization that teaches public speaking and leadership skills through a worldwide network of clubs. Stacy is originally from California, but after retirement will reside in North Carolina with her husband, Tom. Some of her hobbies include hiking, kayaking, traveling, reading, and spending time with her husband, Tom, and their eight children in Southern Pines, North Carolina. So with that, uh, welcome to the so show, Stacey. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been a long time. It's been a, quite a long time and it's good to catch up. So yeah, um, let me shift gears because this is one way I like to get into the, to the interview and warm up a little bit and give you a chance to, to talk freely. Uh, what does the first 30 to 60 minutes of your day look like now that you're going to be retired soon, but uh, now that you're in retirement mindset versus your first 30 to 60 minutes when you were on active duty? Mm, so different. I mean, just it's night and day. So different. Um, now I actually have, now that I'm retired or soon to be retired, because I'm actually retiring one December. Um, now I actually have time to enjoy and just act, wake up allow my body to wake up, allow my mind to wake up. So that's really different for me. Before it was in the military, it's just go, go, go from the second my eyes open to the second they close at the end of the day. Just it, it was such a fast pace. So I really try now um, to make it a practice to meditate first thing in the morning. I do a meditation. I set an intention for the day. Um, I'm kind of bougie with my coffee as well. So like before I do all that, I start my water, make sure it's all boiled to the right temperature. And then I do the French press. And so that's as I'm waiting for it to steep, I sit down, I read an affirmation or something, I open up the windows and then I just enjoy my morning. That's what I do now. And as I'm sipping my French press bougie coffee and yeah, it, it really turns my day around. I think everybody in the army should have 30 to 60 minutes before they start their day. Yeah. So you've transitioned from the military press to the French press. Yes, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> so even going way, way back to the beginning, when you first joined the military, can you give us like the time and place? Of course it was California. Um, but what exactly what exactly was the mindset that you were in what was the trigger that kind of set you in the in the path to go enlist into the military we had a very interesting childhood 
I don't want to say it was necessarily negative because I think it's everything that we make of it. Um, but we did growing up, we didn't even see my parents a lot. Uh, in fact, one of my fondest memories and actually after some lots of therapy, I realized like things that I had missed and triggers that I had like, so for when, for instance, I was doing an EMDR session, um, which is some, a type of therapy to kind of go back to reorganize the files in your brain. And you're supposed to just say something randomly. Um, doesn't matter how silly it sounds or whatever. And the only thing I could think of was donuts. And I felt really dumb for saying it, but that that's what came to my mind. And once they went through all of the steps and they figured it out, it was the donuts was my mom. She worked in a bakery and we didn't get to see her very often. So she would drop us off at the babysitter's house after our baths at night and we would sleep at the babysitters. Then we would go to school. We would go back to the babysitters. We would eat dinner there. My mom would pick us up and she had this big blue coat uh, that smelled like donuts. And <laughs> that's when she would pick us up. She would take us home, bathe us, and then take us right back down to the babysitters. So that was like early childhood. I never saw them much. Um, but then later we found out, later we went camping. So let me back off. So we went camping for a while and that was one of my best memories in my entire life. Like I loved it. I mean, we slept under the stars. We didn't have a tent, you know, we slept under the stars. We, uh, I remember I had this rock that I could do the heat up with. And what the heat up was is I got a bag of water and I had to find the perfect rock that hit the sun. So the water would get warm. And that was what we would bathe with. And it was just an awesome camping trip. We went campsite to campsite, state to state. We went through Utah, Wyoming, um, Nevada, and then we ended up in Colorado. And later I found out when I took my kids camping, years, years later, I called my mom and I was like, oh my God, we went camping just like we did when we were kids. And she's like, honey, we never went camping. I was like, yes, we did. And then I start retelling the stories and she's like, oh shit, honey. No, no, we were homeless. <laughs> we didn't have a home. <laughs> and it was like, really? That wasn't camping? We don't, people don't camp like that? And she's like, no, what did you do to your children? <laughs> so it is perspective, I guess. You know, it's I, I think about the struggles that she had. My dad was a big drug lord in California. Um, that's why we didn't see our parents very much. It's why we were always at the babysitters. Then went camping for a bit. Um, the struggles that my mom had and never really let us know, which is a blessing and a curse at the same time. It, it shows a lot of her resilience of how she can make the most scariest moment in her life, the most wonderful memory in mine. That's pretty phenomenal. But at the same time, it also shows that resilience is only relying on yourself and there's no connection. So with that, and then just the rest of the childhood growing up, there was, there was a lot of trauma. There was a lot of verbal abuse, physical abuse, uh, and I just needed to get away. I didn't want to be there. I felt I didn't belong. And I remember it was my junior year in high school. And I, I just, I needed to go. I, I knew that if I stayed there in the area that I was in, I would end up like my father who was killed in a drunk driving accident when I was 15. Um, he was the drunk driver. Um, parents were alcoholics. I knew that my path wasn't going to be good if I stayed there. So I found a program to be an exchange student. And it, I could, it was funded, everything was good. And my parents said, hey, as long as you get your grades up back to A's, we'll send you. I called their bluff. Got all straight A's and I ended up going to Australia for my senior year. So I, and that was just the beginning. It was the family there, the culture, the everything. It was so beautiful and was like what an actual family and community should be like or could be like. And when I got back, it was, I seen the world. I seen a big part of the world and everybody else at where I lived was just doing the same thing. Same street corners, same arguments, same topics. It was they, there was so much of the world they didn't see. And that's when I knew I was like, yeah, this isn't, 
Yeah, you can't be extraordinary and live an extraordinary life if you just have ordinary moments. And I had to go. So yeah, I signed um, when I was 17 and shipped out right after my 18th birthday. Yeah, it's a, a super amazing story. And I love to hear it over again, even though I know the story already, but uh, many people don't know the story. And that's a really very winding way to get to to joining the military. That's it's incredible. And it just it, it, it highlights like expanding your mind and expanding your experience and expanding your surroundings in order to see beyond the horizon um, of what you're seeing on the street corner on, you know, your friends and your family and your acquaintances and, and the people that you hang around with every day. It's, it's really fascinating that, that that led you then to joining the military, which is just an extension of, you know, studying abroad basically. So that's incredible. Um, how does everything feel now that you're retired compared to the day to day of being on active duty. I mean, I know you, you incorporated a lot of things in your life in active duty that kept you not only busy and active in, in the community and in, in the military abroad, but, um, what is the feeling now that you get now that you've hit the retirement phase versus being on active duty for so many years? I would love to say that I have it all figured out, but I'd be lying <laughs> completely. Um, it's a day-to-day -day process. Uh, I, I do feel I have more autonomy and that is nice. I'm, I'm in control of what I want to do with my day and how I want to do it. That's nice. Um, but there, it, it, there is a void there. There's, and I don't know if it's because I didn't have closure really leaving the military it was it just happened so fast and then it was like boom here it is uh there there wasn't a, much of a transit does that make sense there wasn't a this transition period really it was just like boom there it is and it's like okay let me figure my damn life out and that's when i started realizing that i have not taken care of myself as much as i could have um i put other things as priority and even up until the last day of the military, I worked until the very last day. I was going TDY teaching resilience courses and at, for West Point cadets and then back in California, back to back, um, rearranging appointments that I had for my medical. And then it was like a couple weeks later, I was out. <laughs> so it was, I didn't, I didn't give myself the time. So now that I'm out, I, I realize there were a lot of benefits there were a lot of opportunities, if you will, that I didn't take advantage of. And so now it's a lot of research and reading on my own and trying to reach out to people, that, which is really hard for me, reaching out to others. I'm usually the person that people reach out to. Um, so knowing that I, I have to pick up the phone as well and say, hey, not having a good day. Or, hey, I'm really struggling. Um, that that's been really up and down to to even a point where my husband was really worried about me for a minute like there were days where it was just I think one month I just drank the entire month I was like okay day drinking because I don't know what to do with my life <laughs> why haven't I day drink before this is the fun and then it was like oh I haven't gone to the gym <laughs> where'd those extra 20 pounds come from <laughs> And then when you're not taking care of yourself in all those ways, you start to feel sluggish. You start to feel crappy. Um, and then I just started really thinking, because you have time to think, you have a hell of a lot of time to think. Um, looking back at the 24 years is, am I making a difference? Did I make a difference? Do I have purpose here in this world? What am I doing now? Um, and cried a lot. And my husband finally was just like, Hey, you, you need to get some support. <laughs> I know you're the one that's always there for others, but you need to get some support. So I ended up having to go. That's why I had to cancel that last interview we did have. Um, I had to go to behavioral health and I had to, I had to get some medicine that I need because it's, I can't do everything on my own. And that that's a hard realization. So 
So some days are really good and I love the autonomy. And then other days there's just a lot of time to think about everything I've already done and did it make a difference? So it's a, it's a balance. It's a struggle. Yeah. I was interviewing, um, general Robinson the other day and he mentioned that as well, that void that kind of like when the military stops, it literally like cuts you off. <laughs> it's, it's like being at the bar and, and it's the last round and you're like, yeah, I want another. And then they're like, nope, sorry. It's closing time. Like you're done. <laughs> last call. You're out. <laughs> I don't care where you go. You just can't stay here. Time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You don't have to go home, but. Uh, <laughs> can't stay here. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he mentioned that as well. And I think a couple other people have mentioned that as well. It's just this void that you fall into once you leave the military. Cause you leave like all the support and you leave all the. Uh, the access to email and resources and people and um, you just kind of fall into this black hole for for lack of better terms of not having that all around you not to not to mention the fact that you're you're losing the camaraderie with all the people that you've been working with and you've been encountering throughout your day and throughout your week and throughout your month and year Um, so yeah it's a strange weird place that you fall into when you, when you transition over to retirement or even if transitioning out after, you know, five or six years or whatever, it's the same, I think, um, maybe not so drastic. You know, and it's interesting too, like with that, you're, you've been deployed. So it's when you you're deployed for a long period of time, well, hell, I mean, maybe even six months, everything really stops for you. Cause you're just focused on this one thing. You're focused on this mission and getting back safe. And then you come back and everybody else, like your kids have grown. They, they don't even recognize you. Like everything is, their life is still continuing. Um, but you've been in this hold pattern. I feel like that's kind of how it feels in a sense with retirement because everybody else is still working, still doing all the things. It, the army never stopped. So they're still as busy as I was, but now I'm seeing it from a different side. And it's like, oh, they need to calm down. <laughs> They need to slow down a little bit. What's going on over there? <laughs> so especially with my husband in, you know, it's like his days are so long and it just, it keeps going. It keeps going. And now I'm in this place where time is kind of just paused and stopped. And so that, that it, that's a, it's a hard transition in that way as well. Yeah. Yeah. I like to look at it from the, from the, the silver lining of it where it's like, and maybe it's because I've just, position myself mentally beforehand. And it's really a reason why I want to try to highlight some of the stuff in these interviews is being able to mentally prepare yourself for retirement before retirement happens. Even if it's one year out, six months out, two years out, five years out, however long it takes to be able to start to build patterns and shift and change patterns that you have in your life to understand that once you get past the military, like there's going to be a different environment that you find yourself in. You're going to be surrounded by different friends and family. You're going to be surrounded by different job, um, who knows what it is. And just to kind of build those, those mental cues in to your life in the form of habits or whatever it may be, where you can actually then take the time and take the one or two hours that you have free that you never had before to be able to sit, to read, to think, to meditate, like whatever, walk the dog, play tennis, whatever it happens to be, um, that you can actually, you actually have the space to do that. And to, and it's, it's almost like an uncomfortable pause in a, in a conversation, right? You have that five second or 10 second pause where you're like, okay, do I say something now? Or do I shut up? Like, what do I do? Uh, it's the same kind of thing, but on a, on a wider scale, right? Uh, when you leave the military, you have that, that uncomfortable pause in your day where you're just like, hmm, there's absolutely nothing going on and nobody's home. And I have my French press coffee here and I can do it in an hour instead of, you know, three minutes. So yeah, it's a, that's a really, it's interesting. I'm, I'm curious to see what, what I discover in my, in my journey here of doing these interviews of how often these things play out and the patterns that come about from, from different retirement journeys. It's really, really fascinating to me. Yeah. 
It was, I think, the first day. Um, it was my first day off. Day off. <laughs> the first day off from the military. And my husband came home. And I swear, I shit you not, I had, like, the whole, the whole kitchen, the whole counter was covered in food. I had pork chops and steak and chicken and potatoes. And he was like, babe, you know, it's only us here this week, right? And I'm like, I didn't know what to do. I needed something to do. <laughs> and he was just like, okay, okay, it's cool. It's cool. This is great. This is meal prep for real. But uh, we got to figure something else out because you can't do this every single day. <laughs> so, yeah, that was a... Uh... It's interesting, the, the things that you find to occupy the space in that time. And it's like, huh, I wonder what this is like. Or, um, But the scariest one I had, like, I remember sitting down and I just felt, like, really tingly. Like, my body felt really weird, um, very light and kind of just, like, not light, but, like, heavy more. And it was just like, oh, like, but I feel tingly and my head feels light and something's wrong something's really wrong and I remember I called my friend and she was like oh honey that's relaxing what you're experiencing right now is relaxation and I'm like that's what this is <laughs> I'm like I don't know if I like it I don't know if this is for me <laughs> she's like you'll get used to it just relax breathe <laughs> it's kind of crazy I don't know I don't know if this is uh this feels so weird so let me uh, let me shift over to your process of your military retirement. I say generally the last 180 days are probably the most critical, but it could be the last year, it could be the last 30 days. Um, what did that process look like for you prior to signing out, getting your DD-214? And were there any experiences that you may have stumbled upon along the way whether it was stress, anxiety, happiness, relief, um, and how did you deal with that specific thing, if there's one that stands out? I guess you could say that the last 180 days, if I had to give you a metaphor, it would, my life is like standing up in a hammock. It's, it's, it was very unbalanced, very, uh, very surreal. Um, I, I think I was, I had this, idea that I had more time, even though I saw, I, I even had spreadsheets with my days and all my appointments. And when I started leave, like very organized, but that didn't even matter because it wasn't in my head yet that I was getting out. So there was a lot of things that I missed. Um, I missed out on the internship. Um, I did not order my medical records on time. So trying to get that information and then contact different hospitals um, to get my medical records to start a disability claim. Um, it was kind of just a real shit show. I didn't know where I was at or what to do. And there were people that had retired, but, and there's the checklist that you have, but it's so much, it's so much information. And it's like, where, where do I even start? I feel like I'm on a scavenger hunt. I don't, I, okay, I got this one. Now, where do I go? <laughs> got this one. And, and it was, it was intense. Um, there was a lot of stress. There was a lot of anxiety. Um, but I kept telling everybody I was fine because I was excited that I was like, I'm getting out, I'm getting out. And all these wonderful things for when you retire, but the actual process, I really didn't pay attention to. And I regret that. I regret not stopping work ahead of time and making my appointments a priority. Um, one thing that I really find interesting with the military is when you get to a new duty station, what do you have? In processing. You have in processing and a sponsor, right? So if you have questions, this person is assigned to you and, and like in a perfect world if all the sponsorship worked, right? You have this person before you even move that is telling you good schools, different places that you need to go to. Um, basically, if they're there for you, anything that you need, their sponsors there to help you out. Why don't they have that when people retire? Like, why are we assigned a life coach or a sponsor that's like, let me help you get your shit together? <laughs> and I mean, in the grand scheme of things, yeah, we're adults and we should be able to do it ourselves, but there's so much. There's so much information. There's so many steps. There's, 
I mean, like this, this VA book. Okay, I've read this thing five times and I've gone online and I'm still finding stuff. Like, it's intense. Uh, um, so yeah, so my last 180 days, and I'm still on terminal leave right now, so I don't actually get out till one December. And now that even that date's catching up, did you know, for instance, that you don't even get your last paycheck? You do because you're retired. They don't, they told me I was, my last paycheck was gonna be November 15th. And I'm like, no, no, I retire one December. And they're like, no, no, we hold it. In case you owe the army anything. I'm like, well, that's some bullshit. Why didn't you tell me that a long time ago? None of that was told to me before. Um, I lost 15 days of leave. They were just like, nope, when you were active component in regular army, uh, you sold back leave. And I was like, but did I sell back 60 days? And they're like, it says you did. And I was like, hmm, I don't think that's accurate. And they're like, well, I don't know what to tell you. you all that leave you were going to cash in, it's gone. And I'm like, if I would have known that, I would have changed my retirement date to maybe one January. And then I would have got paid on one December. Um, so just a lot of different things that you pick up along the way that it's like, why wasn't this? And, and then the people will say, well, it was in the handbook. Which one? You gave me 10. Which one? So uh, I don't know if I answered your question, but it's it, the last... 90 to 180 days, like even before I got my two, there, there was just, it was over information overload. And if you wait till just then to do it, you've missed the ball. Like you've missed, you've missed the game completely. It's, it's done. You're going to be stressed. So I, I really believe that you need to start, if you're looking at retirement, doing it more than two years out, two years in a minimum of like setting yourself up for success, start going to the classes then writing notes, have a journal just for retirement um, and the questions that you have along the way. So that way you're not getting to that 90 day mark, even that 180 day mark of going like, what the, what the hell do I do with my, like, where am I going? <laughs> Does somebody have a map? <laughs> yeah. Where's the secret map you speak of? Yeah. Like Dora the Explorer. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> back, 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 back. It's like, why is everybody speaking a different language? <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> Actually get flagged for saying Dora the Explorer on YouTube. Oops. Um, yeah, no, that's that's really the whole point of all this. And it's something that I found myself. I, I actually went to SFL TAP, which is the Transition Assistance Program. Um, and I went there two years and one day from the day that I was anticipating my retirement. And I guess that was pretty accurate because I, when I went in the door, they were like, yeah, you can come and start two years out. And I'm like, okay, cool. So where do I sign up? And they're like, yeah, you're a day over two years. So you got to come back tomorrow. And I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> so yeah, I, I agree. And I think it's, uh, it's imperative. Like, like we said earlier, like planning mentally, um, starting the process and actually going to your, to your boss or your, your team or whatever and saying, look, I'll work up until, you know, July, but after July, like the rest of that time I need to be able to do this paperwork, to be able to turn in my CIF, to be able to start the VA process. If I want to do the six month internship thing, I need time to do that. So yeah, I missed out on a few things myself because I did the same up to a point. And then I went to my boss or my, my counterpart and I was like, look, this is the day where I stop <laughs> and I knife hand him when I said it. No. <laughs> well, why do you think it took you so long to ask your boss for that? Was it a personal reason? Like, was it a personal belief that you had of? My personal reason was because we were doing a mission that we started a year and a half prior with planning. It was supposed to be a European mission. And at the same time, COVID hit. So like literally while I was at the, the initial planning conference, COVID kicked in. I almost didn't make it back to the States because I was in Hungary or somewhere. And so not only the fact that I wanted to really, really do that mission, but the fact that um, I guess I'm mission driven, like I need a purpose and that was my purpose at the time. So I decided that I wanted to see it all the way through to the end. I wanted to make sure I set everybody up for success and also slightly stepping back a little bit and letting people take control and have 
the, the accolades and be in charge of the stuff because, you know, I can sit there and be great, but if my team isn't great, then, then I'm not great. So yeah, I decided to, to see the mission through, I had a lot of time invested in it. So there was that kind of like sunk cost fallacy that kind of came into play. Um, and I knew what the timeline was and I knew what my timeline was for retirement. So I decided, okay, that, that'll be my last day. Like once this mission's completed, once we're done, once we get all the, the news reels and all that stuff out of the way, then, then I'll start my retirement stuff for real, for real. But in between, I was still doing stuff on the side. I just wasn't fully, fully engaged in it until that point. Yeah. You got to kind of set boundaries, whether it's in life with, with people, with relationships. <laughs> yeah. You have to, you have to set boundaries. That's that's the only way you can get things accomplished. It's, it's, it's a lot of saying no to things that you're not willing to fully 100% commit your time to. Yeah, I agree. I just, I would, I'm, I'm curious. And maybe after you do so many of these interviews, you can find that common denominator as well of just the, the personal beliefs and whether it's mission focused of like you wanting to see something all the way through, like I finish what I start. So I, I want to make sure people are set up for success. Um, for me, it was like kind of in the same way. It was, I didn't want to let people down. I have this knowledge and experience that I'm bringing to the team and trying to hand it off is, is an awesome feeling, but you want to make sure they have everything at the same time. So yeah, learning how to say no and without the guilt of like, did I do enough? Did I, did I see it all the way through? Did do they have everything that they need so I can bounce? Um, and I think looking at it now, I mean, everything's figure outable. They would have figured it out because <laughs> <You know? laughs> they're figuring it out now. I don't get any calls through the day. <laughs> so, so really it's like, I, I say a lot of the times, like I, I have this immense guilt. I don't want to let people down or whatever, but they'll figure it out. The, the army will move on without you. And usually it's the end of the day. It's like, should I call them? Like, do they have everything still? Maybe I should touch base. And they're like, dude, you're retired. <laughs> Go drink a beer. <laughs> Go do something. So it's it's interesting to me, just like the reason why, why we don't take care of ourselves, why we put it off. Um, so I was just curious about that. Yeah, no, and, and that that's a great segue into uh, another question is when you when you left or even probably before you left and maybe it's something that you have done throughout your career maybe it's something you just did on this last tour but did you happen to leave behind a smart book or some kind of data base or some kind of information that you left behind to your team to your predecessor so that they could then be successful in what they're doing following in your footsteps absolutely i put a file folder on the share drive. If Munoz gets hit by a bus, this is everything you need to know. <laughs> <laughs> so um, everybody that comes in, they can see it. It's like, oh, this looks important. <laughs> Templates, uh, minutes to meetings, different things. Um, I was also in charge of all of the ACFT portion. So that was like one of the last missions I had. And then of course, yeah, COVID hit. So my name was on every single package that went out. Um, I got calls every single day, starting at three o'clock in the morning till however late at night because, and I had to, because there wasn't people at the reserve centers, there was nobody there. So it was, they would call me, I would get a hold of somebody. They would get a hold of somebody to go and pick up this equipment or to let somebody in for the equipment. Um, which, I kept a database for and made a map points and everything else. So I had all that on file and I put it in the, if Munoz gets hit by a bus uh, folder <laughs> or retires, <laughs> but see, nobody's going to look at it if it says retires. I mean, hit by a bus, I'm intrigued. What is this? <laughs> so yeah, I love the little, little Easter eggs of just everything that I've done um, to include all the retirement stuff as well. Uh, my packet was kicked back like five times. So I had to change my retirement date five times <laughs> because I kept missing the thing. And I was like, holy crap. <laughs> and then the funniest one was when they called me and they're like, yeah, the USARC G1 kicked this back um, because you have the wrong leave form. 
it's, it's the right leave form. Yeah, but there's a new version of that leave form. So we have to redo it because the USARG G1 kicked it back. And I was like, okay, um, let me call you right back. Call my husband. I'm like, dude, did you just kick my shit back? Because he's the USARG G1. <laughs> he's like, no, I didn't see it. <laughs> who's, who's using my name? <laughs> so, and then, so I had a, a cheat sheet for when you want to submit your retirement packet. Which 4187 do you use? What information do you need? What do you need to sign? What version of a leave form do you need? But look it up just in case it changes again. Um, so everything that they needed to know for that, I also left in there. So they don't struggle as much as I did in that process. Yeah, that's actually fantastic. And that's really strange point that you bring up there. I mean, you've worked at HRC, you worked at USARC, like how is that possible that your packet got kicked back five times? It's insane to me. Yeah. Well, like in one of them, it got kicked back because I was signing out on a Monday and they're like, oh no, you can't sign out on a Monday. Why? I'm intrigued. Why? And they're like, you can only sign out on a Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. What happens on Mondays and Fridays? So then I had to recalculate my dates again so I could make that date work. And then they're like, okay. So then they process. I still don't know what happens on Mondays and Fridays. So if you get in your interviews and you find out what happens on Mondays and Fridays, let me know. Because <laughs> it's, it's a mystery. It's a world mystery. Uh, and then it got kicked back. They're like, oh, well, because now it's the... um. Instead of the permissive TDY, you have the, what is the ISA and the TAA, and you could split that. You could split those leaves up, but you can't use them back to back. So if I had TAA and then I started my ISA the next day, they're like, oh, no, you can't do that. You have to have a day in between. I'm like, where it doesn't say that anywhere, anywhere. Where do you get this information? So then that got kicked back. And then by the time I submitted it again, the leaf form changed. So that's when the USARG G1 kicked it back. So it was a nightmare just to even get it through to HRC. Oh, and then the, the funniest part, <laughs> I was like, fine, this is like five, six times kicked back. Then the STB at USARC, they're just like, oh, we're going to need a letter of lateness from you as to why this packet's late. I'm like, okay, because you didn't process it. <laughs> Well, we don't want to submit that to HRC. Well, then you write a letter. I don't know what to tell you. I'm not changing my date again. Although I should have because I lost 15 days of leave. <laughs> so just, just for those in the audience who may or may not know what TAA and ISAA is that? What are those, what are those things? It's basically the permissive TDY. Uh, you used to get the, the 20 days of permissive TDY. They changed it to, I can't remember what the acronyms actually are, um, but it's kind of to set yourself up for whether it's house hunting, job searching, whatever it is that you need to do, that personal information or that personal stuff that you need to do. You can take it all at once, which I'm not sure about too. So what if I took it now? Now you've raised a question. What if I took all 20 days? Would I have to have the one day in between? So you could really only take 10 and 10, right? How do we gamify this? Hmm. So you could take it all at once or you could split it up as long as there's a duty day in between. Um, since I'm local in the area, I'm not moving anywhere. It was more beneficial for me to split it up. So I would take three days of TAA here, another two days the next week. So I would have the time during the weeks to get my stuff done but I did not get my stuff done. So if you take this, if you do it, make sure you do the stuff. It's actually very, very helpful. Trust me. Cause uh, yeah, a lot of people, yeah. It's something that people just probably don't get a chance to think about. Like if these kind of situations, these scenarios is perfect. Cause yeah, you just don't know until you're actually in it. There's some things you just don't know until you're actually experiencing it. And that's really what retirement was for me and a lot of people that I've talked to as well. It's just, it's a black box. It's a scavenger hunt. It's really a scavenger hunt. <laughs> Going on an adventure. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. So now that that's all said, um, 
Was there a favorite part of the retirement process that you like, like one specific station that you had to go to or one specific place that you had to go and do something for your retirement that you really, really enjoyed, that you had a good customer interaction with the staff there or anything like that? Not really. Um, but if one does stand out, <laughs> it was one during the resume writing class. Uh, the, um, the gentleman, he was an older gentleman. He had never served in the military, but he was just a wealth of knowledge. And we would do practice interviews. Uh, and he answered just a lot of great questions. A lot of questions came up of there are some jobs that want to lessen your pay or like when it's you're negotiating salary or whatever uh, because you have a retirement check. So they... And, and I, I hear that. It's very common. It's like, oh, well, you have this, so you could actually make this if you're working for the government again. Uh, and some of the information he had, it was it was great. He was like, yeah, you, you invested. You made an investment 20-something years ago. This is just the dividends that's paid out from your investment. You know, that, and you let them know that. No, this is my pay. This is what you will pay me. Yes, I have a retirement uh, benefits or whatever, but that that's because I earned it. I Did you invest any real real estate or anything else throughout your life that you want to talk about that we should lessen your pay because now you, now you have this inheritance? No, it doesn't work that way. So why cut ourselves short as well? Like when you're going through those job interviews and you're um, negotiating salary and such. Um, so that would, that was very beneficial. Um, and then the same with un un unemployment. Um, I think a lot of people are scared of unemployment, It like what it says about a person. And do you have life insurance? Because it's important because you don't know what's going to happen, right? That's what unemployment is for us right now. We're figuring it the hell out. Unemployment is that same thing. We've paid into the system. And as we're figuring it out, that, that's our life insurance now or our car insurance or whatever. We need it. It's not going to mean that we're on it forever, but until we get our bearings, until we can stand on both feet, because well, I stand on the one, um, then yeah, it, it's okay. And so, and it kind of goes back to all those beliefs that we have as well of what we think about unemployment or welfare or just the different support systems that are out there that we don't use because of the beliefs that we have. Um, I think the army needs to focus a little bit more on talking about those things as well, because it is part of the transition process and you may need it. Somebody might not find a job right away, not lack of trying, but the economy has changed. Everything has changed. So it, it's, it's okay. It's okay to ask for support. Yeah, actually that's, that's interesting. I actually look at the, the military retirement the exact same way as an investment, um, when I was doing my math for the retirement and like what it's supposed to be. And if I want to stay 20 years to do retirement, that's exactly how I looked at it as a, an investment of time to get a dividend result in the end. Um, so that's fascinating that he actually said that that's exactly the way I look at it. <clears throat> and just to be honest, like it's really the, best investment you could possibly make for that kind of a return because i mean let's let's be frank like we're going to live more than 10 or 15 more years like we're going to be around for another 30 or 40 years hopefully you know if everything goes right unless you get hit by a bus unless you get hit by... <laughs> and then make sure you have a folder that says if i get hit by a bus with all your stuff in it um yeah no it's it, you can't make a better investment of I mean, the time is definitely a big trade-off, but the, the monetary return on that time is something you can't do with any other investment vehicle. It just, it's, it's not possible. So, so I would say that that, that was, that was probably the best part of the retirement process is just, is hearing the experienced people that have been through it, um, or that have seen so much of what is out there, what can happen and just listening, just not going in there with the mindset of like, I have it all figured out. Cause you don't, you don't. And just listening to the advice and not being afraid to just say, Hey, can you tell me a little bit more about this? <laughs> I, I don't quite understand this piece. So, um, yeah, very knowledgeable, very knowledgeable man. Let me ask you this. 
where are you spending most of your time now that you have the retirement space? In my craft room. So I had to find a hobby. And is that what you meant? Like, what am I doing kind of like with my time now? Yeah. Um, I think you have to find something when you retire. Um, because if you just focus on your thinking, you could go a little stir crazy. And that, I, I did that too. So, uh, but the kids, the triplets, so I went to college this year. So we actually have five kids in college right now. Crazy. Um, but we turned one of their rooms into a craft room. So I started making cards and just opening up more of a creative side. And it kind of helps me with my perfectionism as well. Uh, because even if it's the shittiest card, even if it's ugly as hell, if somebody gets it in the mail, it's like, oh, this isn't a bill. This is really cool. So even my worst card is going to make somebody else's day. And I have to get over that perfection of, oh, I can't mail this because it's not perfect yet. You know, and so, so it helps me kind of cope as well on perfectionism and just doing something, not waiting until it's perfect. Um, so that, that's been, it's been a joy. I actually really enjoy the cards and, and I, I love it when I just send them to random people. I, and it's really weird. Nobody wants to give me their address. It's kind of the scary part. It's like, Hey, what's your address? They're like, why are you going to show up? Like what's going on? <laughs> so, uh, that's always fun, <laughs> but yeah, it's just this random act of kindness to let people know that I'm thinking of them. And that actually kind of stems back, uh, I figured out why I was so drawn to the cards and the card making while I was retired in my moment of thinking. So thinking can be good. Uh, I had a lot of time to process and right after the camping incident, um, we moved to Colorado and we had to steal from the Salvation Army at night, you know, so we would raid the trucks. Well, we, speaking of scavenger hunt, we thought we were on a little scavenger hunt, little treasure box and then the cops got called one day and, you know, my stepdad's like putting stuff back in the thing and we're taking it out. He's like, no, no, we're just dropping off some stuff. Um, <laughs> crazy times. And we had like, I remember it was like my eighth birthday and we didn't have a table. We had no furniture. We had nothing. And my parents found a bucket, my mom and my stepdad. It was, he turned into my stepdad. He wasn't my stepdad in the moment. Um, but they had a bucket and they put one of those cable rounds cable room card and they put it on top and they threw a sheet over it and that was our table so there's a picture with me wearing a sheriff badge sitting with my brother and my sisters around this little cable cart homemade table deal thing which was pretty awesome um so that was it was an adjustment but we never heard from my dad again like so that was really really weird he just my mom was running from him she feared her life so we didn't know that at the time. We just knew that my dad wasn't, our dad wasn't in our lives. And then one day, like six months after we were in Colorado, he found us. He hired a private investigator um, and gave my mom an ultimatum basically of, hey, you either move back to California or I'm going to file kidnapping charges. So he came to Colorado to see us. And I just remember being really angry with him. Um because he wasn't there when you're eight you don't understand and he just wasn't there and I was mad and he was like baby girl I wrote you every single day I sent you cards I sent you a birthday card I sent you a Halloween cards I sent you Thanksgiving cards and I'm like no you didn't like you didn't send us anything and then he left on the plane back home and we were talking to my mom like she had all of us around this little monkey table <laughs> and uh I, we asked her about it. We're like, dad said that he sent us stuff. And she, I remember her coming out. She had this big trash bag filled with letters and cards. And every single day, my dad wrote me every day, even if it was just a sentence, sorry. even if it was just a sentence, he made sure to let us know that we weren't forgotten and that he wasn't giving up on us. And that we mattered. Um, birthday cards. I still have them. And so Hans, like looking at it now, like when I was processing that memory the other day, I was like, I hope the cards that I send people warms their heart like my dad warmed my heart. 
I hope that it helps somebody just get through the day and just let, let them know that somebody's thinking of them and somebody's there. And it's probably not a perfect card, so get over it. Um, but, but that, so that's where I spend most of my day now is just is making, making cards so I can brighten people's day. That's amazing. It's really amazing. And it's a really interesting analogy of how you got to that space in inadvertently un, unconsciously got to that space and then rewound and found out that that was the, the source of it. Um, it's really, really good. Everything's connected. That's what I'm learning more than anything. Everything is connected. It all connects. Yeah, it's a very small marble we live on. Indeed. <laughs> um, did you happen to give yourself a retirement gift? And if so, what was it and why? <laughs> Craft room. So yeah, so there's that. Um, and the purple hair. <laughs> so which is really expensive. I don't understand why hair is so expensive to color. <laughs> so I've been in the wrong business, obviously. But yes, purple hair, um, because I'm my own boss. Like I, I don't, I don't conform. And that's what I'm like leaning into and really like discovering and loving and learning is through all the mess, through all the chaos of just which way to go and where to go. I have the choice of just being me. And you know what? If I want freaking purple, I don't know if I can cuss on here. I've been cussing. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> if I want freaking purple hair, then I'm going to have purple hair and it doesn't make me, you can judge me all day long. I don't care. I don't care. It's just, this is just who I am. Um, I'm just letting my freak flag fly. <laughs> and so it's just kind of like a gentle reminder to me that I'm in control of my own life. Like I'm doing my thing and I don't have to fit in somebody else's mold. Yeah. I, um, the way I think about it is retiring from the military or retiring from anywhere actually, but retiring from the military specifically is like winning the freedom lottery. Uh, so like, you know, when you win the lottery or at least the saying goes, when you win the lottery, the money that you get amplifies who you actually are. Meaning money is the root of all evil. No, it's not. It actually just amplifies who you were before you got the money. Um, so the, the retirement lottery winnings of time and freedom, just actually amplifies who you are as a person deeply down and allows you to become, uh, allows you to express that in, in way more extravagant ways beyond the military. So yeah, I like that purple hair. <laughs> Did you happen to receive a retirement gift from anyone else for your retirement? And if you received many gifts, uh, was there one specific one that really uh, grabbed your attention and and uh, had deep, deep meaning? Not to go back to the craft room, but my, my husband is very, very supportive. Um, very supportive. Like, I won the freaking lottery with this man. He's just, he's an incredible, incredible human. Um, supports my crazy, supports my roller coaster of emotions and events. And it's like, Hey, you know, this is what I want to do. I want to look at this. And he's like, do we need hardwood floors for that? Let's see what our options are. <laughs> and so he, he's, he's great with that. Um, so he's, I'm pretty spoiled in anything. Like I, I have to be careful sometimes, even when I have an idea, cause he's like, Oh, let's go and do it. Let's get that for you. And I'm just like, calm down turbo. This is just the thought right now. We might not want to get all the goats. Let's just hold off on the fainting goats and all the things. Um, so heal me with the craft room. But as far as just like retirement gift, no, no. Um, I didn't even get my award. Like I, I'm a little, not bitter. I don't know what the word is. Um, and it kind of goes back to like, reevaluating my purpose. But then at the end of the day, I realize it's not about me. It's just the army continued to go on and they're so busy that the intention is there, but the action gets held up. Um, and I have to remember that because sometimes I forget and it's just like, well, come on, man. I've 
flipping retired, like nothing, not a lump. Like what's happening right now? Did I mean nothing? Um, but it, it's not me. It's everybody's so busy and it's in this rat race of on to the next project, on to the next thing. And that makes me really sad. Yeah. And I think it actually, because me personally, I didn't do a retirement ceremony or anything like that, even though many, many people came up to me and said, Hey, you know, when's your retirement ceremony? Um, I think it goes back to that intentionality of stopping work and actually making retirement the forefront of your thoughts and your actions and your words, because at least the pattern that I've seen or the pattern that I make believe that is true is, um, the people who actually do the retirement ceremony, who go through the process of planning out this big elaborate thing and making banners and making table settings and ordering food and sending out invites to people and getting people involved in their retirement ceremony are the ones who end up getting that sort of attention. Cause it's really just kind of a coin flip, you know, people are busy, but if you make it aware to them that you're retiring and you make a big deal about it, um, not a big deal being braggadocious, but a big deal being intentional about your retirement, about the ceremony, about how you want things done. Um, I feel like that's the, the people that end up getting like, you know, the plaques and the awards and the blah, blah, blah. Like I didn't get really anything when I left either. So, um, and I didn't expect to, I wasn't trying to, I was trying to get the hell out of there so I could go continue on with my life is what I was trying to do. And I let everybody know that, and that was my intention and that's how it went down. Um, but I did go back. I circled back maybe a month into transitional leave and went back and like invited a few people, a handful of people to uh, a luncheon and we just sat and had lunch and chatted. And, um, and that was cool for me. That was enough uh, for some people. They just need a big elaborate ceremony and a big hall with 300 people and a big cake. And I just don't need all that. Like that's not my style. It's not my jam. Yeah. yeah it's not my jam either. And you know, it's so funny. Cause everybody's just like, everybody said the same thing. Are you going to have a retirement ceremony? You need a retirement ceremony. And it's like, no, oh, it's not my, not my thing, you know? And, and I broke my foot in the Spartan race. So I wasn't running. And so I put on a little bit of weight. Oh, hell no. I wasn't going to stress about putting on my uniform, my dress uniform. Like that's not the way I want to go out. <laughs> so that's not happening. Um, trying to get all the kids together to one place. I mean, like I said, there's five in college right now, two figuring it out. One still at home. It's all, there's it's a lot. And yeah, so I, I opted not to have the retirement ceremony and everybody's wanting it because they want cake nobody wants to help put that crap together that's exhausting who has time for that <laughs> i didn't i didn't so uh but at the at the same time it was when i signed for my 214 and they gave me this brown i wish i think i thought i had it here because i didn't do anything with it it's got my you know oh and they're like, are you having a retirement ceremony? And I was like, no. And they're like, okay, here you go. Make sure your name is spelled correctly. This is your certificate of retirement signed by the president. This is for your spouse. And they're like, any questions? Oh, we don't have a flag. As soon as we get them, we'll mail them to this address. Um, thank you for your service. Have a nice day. And it was like, that. That. that's it? <laughs> that, that, that's... Well, damn. I mean, I wasn't expecting like confetti to fall from the sky and like balloons or anything, but it, it just, it was a, it was an eye opener of like, oh damn, this just, this happened. And, and it should be somewhat of a big deal. I think I didn't realize that I needed that a little bit more and not, not the big ceremony, not the big thing, but just the lunch. Uh, you know, with some people, we, we actually finally just did that on Friday. I think it's cause they felt bad. Um, check <laughs> because seriously, the whole section had sh shifted. So everybody I knew had PCS and new people came in. So I felt really honored that they came all the way to Southern Pines, this table of people I had no idea who they were <laughs> to wish me farewell. Um, but it, it was nice. It was the gesture was there. It was like, Hey, we didn't do the, the thing we should have like could have done for her um so that it was nice but at the same time it meh, it was just another day yeah
Yeah. Like, and, and as much as I love Tom, I think he forgot too, because I came home and I was like, so today's the last day I'm wearing this bad boy. And he's like, oh, I have a Toastmasters thing. I was like, I'm not going to go tonight. And he was like, okay, bye. And then he left. And so I'm like, okay, well, I'm just going to drink a beer and celebrate on my own. This is weird. And then he felt bad because he came home with the thank you balloon. Just one. The- just one. Just one. And I'm like, what is this? And he was like, thank you for your service. That's all they had. It was this or a birthday one. <laughs> so. But like I said, he spoils me every other day. So it was fine. But um, yeah, so no ceremony, nothing. But I, I, I think that people really should look at if they don't want the ceremony, what type of, what gives them closure? What, and it doesn't have to be a big thing, but letting people know what it is that you need or, and you might not even know that. I didn't know it. I didn't know what I needed, you know? Um, but I think we all need connection. So just, even if it's a few words, send them a card, something with a few words of something of like, Hey, this is what you meant. This is, thank you for doing whatever you did. Because I think that's where some of the closure comes from is just knowing that you made a difference. Knowing that after so many years, you impacted this world in a positive way. You made this place better. And if you don't have any of that, it, for me, it was hard just to kind of look, oh yeah, I'm the shit. I did all A, B, C. I, I don't think like that. So it's sometimes it, it's, I just question myself. So my advice to people going into retirement, what do you need for closure? Asking that question. What, what do you need for closure? This is a big deal. This is a big chapter of your life shifting. What makes you feel good? How do you want to close that chapter out? Is it with a small group of people? Is it a big ceremony? Is whatever it is, it's not dumb because it's what you need and want. So just being able to answer that question ahead of time. Does that make sense? Yeah, it totally makes sense. And that actually leads me into another question about uh, legacy. That's one thing that I like to ask on here to all my guests is what is the legacy that you intended or you thought you were going to leave behind? And did you actually, do you feel like you actually were able to accomplish that and leave that legacy behind, whether that's doing some amazing thing and getting an award for it and getting recognition, whatever for it, or whether that's settings, the, the workplace up in a way that you've made it better than it was when you entered into that workspace, any, anything like that? I think for me, one of the, the best part of my army career is the resilience training program and just being a part of that team, uh, and showing how we can all shift the culture of the army. You don't have to suck it up and drive on. There are resources. There are ways to cope. There are people you can talk to. Um, You don't have to hold the weight of the world on your shoulders and kind of see everything's connected. Kind of goes back to my mom and she did it all on her own. And I think sometimes we fall into that belief, that limiting belief that we have to handle all ourselves. Otherwise we'll be looked at as weak or we're not good soldiers or whatever. So being part of the resilience team um, has been very beneficial for me and in trying to leave that legacy behind that we're all connected. We all need each other. Other people matter, you know, and that they're not just words. They're other people matter and sharing some of my story. I've shared, I started sharing probably in the last couple of years, um, my attempted suicide story with the soldiers, what got me through those times, what led to trying to end my life. And I guess just being open and vulnerable and vulnerable is not an ugly word. It's really a beautiful word. And if we can create a space of belonging where people feel they are safe to be open and vulnerable and connected with others, that's the army that I want it to go to. And so I've left little breadcrumbs throughout. Um, I don't need big recognition for it. Like 
words, you know, whatever. Uh, the things that mean the most to me is the people coming up to me afterwards or the people that are staying in touch or just that personal connection. When I was at West Point, uh, I think it was April. So, which was an interesting course because like they're all West Point cadets and they're very smart. And not that army soldiers aren't smart, but it, it, it was just a different level. Um, and so young and just really showing up, being myself, allowing them to see all my imperfections and my flaws and like just kind of stumbling around and like letting them know, hey, that's cool. Like, it's okay. You're not going to be perfect. Like, we can do this and sharing my story with them. And I remember one girl came up to me before they graduated the, the course and she was like, you know, I was going to get out. I was going to quit. I, she was sexually assaulted. Um, at West Point and they ended up letting the guy graduate and she was torn and yeah, she said after the course and after just me sharing my struggles and my story, my childhood stuff that's happened in the military, she was like, honestly, seeing you being able to speak clearly and to us and help us, she was like, that's the kind of officer I want to be. I'm going to stick this out. And that's the legacy. Just other people matter. And so I hope, I can only hope and pray that, you know, people remember that and keep passing it, like paying it forward and being there for other people. Yeah, the resiliency thing is a, um, it's still kind of controversial, but I think people have actually started to get on board with it. And I'm really, really happy. I mean, you introduced me to the resilience, the army resiliency as well. And that was one of the most rewarding things that I've done in the army period. Um, because of the fact that I got to connect with people on a really deep level. Um, I didn't always teach it the way it was meant to be taught. I mean, I tried to follow the book as much as possible, but I did end up tailoring it to my audience because I realized at some point not everybody is going to take it the same way. And so, so what I ended up doing was sitting down and understanding like, okay, who's my audience? What are their core beliefs and values? What do they think is cool and not cool? What would they resonate with? What would they not resonate with? How can I tailor it to them specifically, whether that's changing the colors of the slides or changing the way I deliver the, the content. And yeah, the, the connection part of it is really the most important part because it's one thing to sit in front of a crowd and talk about resiliency and bouncing back and being strong and knowing how to deal with your own weakness and your own, you know, life struggles, <coughs> excuse me. But it's a whole other thing when you do that and you're standing in front of the person as you're saying it and you're directing the questions directly to them. And it's not putting them on the spot, but really getting them or giving them the opportunity to, to open up a little, even if it's just a little bit. Um, because that then resonates to the rest of the crowd and it and it relaxes the situation that you find yourself in where it's not just a training environment. It's really more of a conversation. Um, yeah, I think that's, it's probably one of the most important things that the army's done in the history of the army as far as taking care of soldiers because the, the core, at least the core belief or understanding that I walk away with from the military of all my time in the services, it's really about taking care of soldiers. And so a lot of the questions that I ask, like, you know, did you leave behind a smart book and things like that? It's, it revolves around those kind of things because those are the values that I grew up with in the army. And I think that that resiliency, the master resiliency training really kind of embodies that on a really deeper level. That's very much needed. I mean, you know, we, we do tours of duty and, you know, really horrible places in really horrible environments and situations. And then we come back and then we're like, okay, we're expected to jump back into the regular mix of things and get back into 
to life. And it's the same with retiring. When you, when you transition out of the military or you retire out of the military, it's the same exact situation, just on a, a lesser scale because you've essentially deployed for 20 years with the military and now you're redeploying to civilian life. And that's a huge transition and it's, it's not an easy one. And it's why I try to dig into it and try to figure it out and try to get answers for, for other people, because there, there is no guidebook to it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That's, that's really important and it's a really good legacy to have to just make the connections with people and, and have that personal connection with people. That's really, really important. It was, um, I think it was in December. I was still on crutches, I think too. So it was an interesting time and command group, General Daniels and all of them needed, they had resilience on the program, like on their agenda. And they're like, oh, Munoz can do it. <laughs> so it's like, okay. And it was, I was teaching them problem solving. So I have literally, it's a small conference room, General Daniels and all of her staff. And I'm trying to teach them problems, problem solving to leadership. It's like, yeah, that you can't just, you have to know your audience. You have to know it is, who it is that you're talking to, but this stuff is important. Like just how can you relate it? So you have to live it in order to relate it. You can't just look at the book and be like, okay, I'm teaching you this from the, this book. And this is exactly how it goes because not everybody's the same fit. And I just remember at the end of the thing, I was teaching them confirmation bias and I was asked them, I was like, what are some of the problems that we have? You know, like, what are some of the problems that we have at USARC? <laughs> and they're listening. They're like, oh, but we solved them. I was like, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. <laughs> this is what you're doing. And they were just like, well, shit. <laughs> General Daniels at the end of it, she's like, so what you're telling me is that our biggest problem at USARC is that we don't know the problems. I'm like, that's it, ma'am. Yes. You don't understand the problem. You keep putting band-aids on everything. Not everything needs the band-aid. <laughs> what is causing the bleeding? <laughs> and she's like, just. <sighs> My husband said he was in the bathroom afterwards and people are like, the staff are going in. They're like, we need to have a meeting. We need to understand what the problems are. <laughs> I hope it went somewhere. I don't know if it did. I didn't do a follow-up, but it's like, but it's resilience training, right? It's, it's talking about the hard stuff. And we as humans are conditioned not to talk about the hard stuff. It's hard. It's hard stuff because it's hard. And, and that's one of the things that I loved about the resilience program. It was, we dug down, we got our hands dirty. It was just like, okay, so what holds us back? What are we doing? What's going on? And just having them be open, like the soldiers, just everybody just leaning in and really looking at something without their blinders on of just, this is what I see. This is, and because then, then leadership can do something about it. But if we as just individual don't understand what's going on or what the problem is, how can we fix it? How can we fix any of it? You know, so it's, it's being able to talk and brainstorm and be creative and um yeah so it was just it's one of the the joys that I had is just sparking just like oh there you go <laughs> sparking just that light for them of just oh I can take this back to my command and I can work on just even if it's just one thing I can work on this piece this piece I have control of this piece that's so powerful and um, I, I think it's, it's a great program. Um, I do believe I've, I've seen the way that it can be looked at. And I think that's just because it's not taught by the right person. Yeah. It takes a very special kind of personality to be able to teach resiliency. I mean, it's not like some kind of zero, 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 one percent of people can do it. Like a lot of people can do it, but it takes definitely, uh, a very deep understanding of compassion and of humility to be able to stand up and teach these really, really hard, soft skills, hard, soft skills. Um, 
and then at the same time in a way that people will take it away and run with it on their own and, and use it on their own i think it really boils down to the reason why it works so well and why it's so effective is it basically creates a layer of transparency where there's usually a layer of of you know opaqueness but not transparency and it's another reason why to even do this at all is to bring some transparency between the va process the the benefits delivery process the you know the internship process the actual retirement process the transition process there's a layer of opacity between those processes and the people who are going through trying to accomplish retirement or transition and i I feel, I hope that this will bring a layer of transparency to it and remove the opacity so that people can feel free to tell everybody about exactly what's the most important thing about the, the transition process or the VA process, especially the people who are actually running those processes. Um, and then to, <clears throat> cause when you do that, you open up, you show vulnerability and you show concern and you show compassion and you show a genuine interest in what people need to do because you know the one side of it is there's people there to to do these things to help with transition to process you out of the military but on the other side of that coin is there's actually people who are actually transitioning out and they're not just a number they're not just a name they're not just a another checkbox on the on the you know the metrics the vanity metrics of the of the office right so and I don't think we set our families up for success with the retirement. Like nowhere on my checklist was there a mandatory course or class for my kids or for my husband. Um, and I saw something, I think it, it was on your channel. Um, you had notes, you were writing to the kids or something like, I think that's just so important as well. We can't set them up for what they're going to see if we don't even know ourselves. Like there should be something that's like, hey, your parent is going to have some mood swings. They're going to have phases of grief and trying to organize everything or trying to, there, there's going, and because it's unfamiliar to them. Like I noticed that with my kids, it's, it's like, what's going on with her? <laughs> Nobody prepared them because, and I couldn't prepare them. I couldn't prepare my eyes because I'd never been through it before, but it's even with deployments they have those courses, they have those classes for family members, like, hey, these are some of the things that your, your person might be going through or seeing, you're going to get frustrated with them. <laughs> these are things that you can do to help that transition. Um, because I think that, that that was one of the, the loneliest points that I have had was feeling un not understood. You know, it's like, I'm trying to keep it together. I'm trying to figure my life out. Um, I feel like the Julia Roberts and runaway bride where I don't know how I like my eggs. And so I'm trying all the eggs because I don't know what's for me yet. And my family members looking at me like she's lost her damn mind. <laughs> and, and they don't know how to support because they've never, nobody gave them the game plan of like, hey, this might happen. Um, so I, I think we could up our game in the military as well of just setting the families up for success of what they could potentially see um, and no triggers. Like what are the signs that I really need to look for? Um, because I'll be honest, John, like I hit a dark point and that's when my husband was like, look, babe, <laughs> some, I'm worried. <laughs> and I was worried because I know my dark place. I know what low feels like for me and to feel back at that spot, completely just isolated alone. I scared myself. That, that's a scary place to be. And then thinking that nobody else understands and it's not nobody, but your family doesn't seem to understand that, that it's, it's a scary place. Um, and I don't know if there's anything in the future that could help family members of like, Hey, these are the things that you need to look for. This is, this is going to be the process. This is, they're going to go through phases of grief. They're going to go through phases of whatever. These are signs you also need to see to look out for, 
to get them support in case they are not reaching the handout. Yeah. My two cents. Yeah. Hopefully somebody will look at this sometime in the future and see that and have an aha moment and, and incorporate a, uh, a transition sponsor or something like that it walks you through as well as incorporating some family transition teachings um, that totally makes sense to me. And what a great way to, for other, for kids to connect with other people too, you know, because I, I can only imagine what it feels like for them. Like, Hey, mom's not herself. Who do I talk to about this? Maybe it's another kid that's been through it. You know, of just like, hey, you can call me. Yeah, I remember my dad went through this or my mom went through this or my aunt, uncle, whatever. And you, it's a lifeline for your kids as well. They have somebody that they can contact um, that's been through it. Um, and it's, it's all about connection. It's all about, it's all connected. It's, told you. it's all connected. And we just, we need to show up for each other more. Um, there's so much more we can do. And there's so much out there. So. so knowing everything you know now in your span of your career and of your life, if you had a chance to go back and sit down with your 16 year old self, maybe over some coffee or well, maybe coffee or whatever, uh, just to sit down for like, say 30 minutes and have a conversation and it doesn't have to be like going back in the past and telling yourself like, Hey, you should totally buy Apple stock on this day, but more so of just going back and having just a, a casual conversation with your 16 year old self, what would that conversation look like? And could you give me a, like a place and a time where you would actually be meeting yourself? I'm very connected to outside. So it would be outdoors, definitely reconnecting. Cause I think that's when I, I'm more present and open to whatever's coming at me. <laughs> uh, so I would definitely go back to my 16 year old self outdoors. Um, and if it was like, say a 30 minute conversation, I think 10 minutes would just be me hugging her and saying, you're enough. It, it's you're enough. And there's going to be struggles. There's going to be ups and downs, but it, it's training. It is train everything that you have been through is training to get you to where you need to go and where you are and where you need to be. And it, it's all connected. Um, trust, trust that it's going to be okay. And you are enough. You don't have to prove yourself to anyone. Just be there for people and you will never be alone. Do you think your 16 year old self would have that same realization that you have now about the outdoors? I think so. I always loved outdoors. I was a tomboy too. So it was, I was always outside climbing trees, just so I think it would be more open to hearing the message. So yeah, because it, it's whenever I'm outdoors, I always, it's, it's that emotion, that awe, you know, and you, the feeling of awe. And I, when I think about it, it's just like, even when I was hiking the Appalachian trail, for a Christmas a couple years back. And I got to the top of this mountain and there were no words to describe it. It was just, ah, oh, like I really, and I just started crying because I realized that every problem that I thought that I had is so small in this huge, huge world. Like it's so much bigger than we know it to be, but we just never sit back and sit in that for a moment and that curiosity, that wonder, the awe of we're all here for a reason. And I, I feel more connected when I'm outdoors, when I'm, I, I can feel the wind on me. I can see the colors of the trees and the leaves and I feel more grounded and connected. And I think I've always felt that even as a kid. Um, so I definitely think my 16 year old self would be outdoors. Maybe we'd be in a tree and if she didn't listen, I'd push her off the tree. So like, figure it out. <laughs> you can't fly home. Let me shift gears real quick and kind of along the same lines, of uh, what we've already discussed, but also a little bit different. If you were to 
be afforded the opportunity to step in front of a group of transitioning military members and you have 20 minutes to give a talk about retirement or transition or both, uh, what would your main topic or thesis be? How would that talk? How would that talk go? Mm, okay. Transitioning. Where are they at in their transition process? Actually, let's say they're at SFL tap doing their, doing their, uh, briefings and stuff like that. And one of the briefings is, uh, Stacy Munoz is here to tell you about her topic on transition. So getting out of the military, whether it's retiring or transitioning out from just ETS. Yeah, I would definitely give them my information. I give them my email, first of all, and how to get a hold of me and my phone number. Um, just as, first of all, here's a lifeline. I might not know the answer, but if you're struggling, I can help you find the answer uh, because it's a lot of information. Um, but the biggest thing I would tell them is it, it, it's going to be different. There's going all of the stuff that's in the VA benefits and the classes and the resume building and all, all of the things it's important. It's so important, but mindset is so important and it's going to be a shift. It's going to be a change. So what are some of the things that you can do to get your mind right when you're having the worst moment in your life, or you think it's the worst moment in your life? Um, and even just brainstorm with them of what that is. Like for me, I found walking. Walking, I can walk anything off. I can walk off a bad mood. I can walk off a temper tantrum. I can, I, I walk it off. That That's my, my woosah moment. But I think we all need to have that plan because it will happen. There will be moments where you're up in the air and you don't know what's going on. And there's nothing in these VA benefit books that's going to solve that or fix it. Those resources are out there. But what is something that you can do for you that makes you feel connected and a sense of belonging on this earth? Because it is a transition. You're not, you may and may not be busy. Are you comfortable with just being in your own skin and giving yourself time and patience and grace and understanding, compassion? And I, I, I hope that they can plan for that as well as all the other things within the military, because I think that's the, probably the most important. Um, so that's what I would talk to them about. How do you get your mind right? Where do you go? When you're falling apart, do you know where you go? <laughs> How do you get back from there? If you've gone there, how do you get back? Do you have a, a, a roadmap? <laughs> so, um, and it's something that we don't talk about. You know, there, there's no resources on there about like that stuff. I didn't, I didn't go to one of those classes and said, Hey, like people said, Oh, it's going to be hard. It's going to be a transition. What does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah. So just maybe a, an understanding of yourself too. Um, and I would tell them, don't weigh too heavily on that damn aptitude test with the dots. <laughs> That's what I would tell them. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about, don't you? No. It made me take this test. I don't, it was so frustrating. It was so, I sat there and I answered all the questions to the best of my ability. And then they give you a printout with dots and numbers. And then the guy's like, okay, so how many of you have dots? And everybody's raising their hands. And he's like, okay, how many of you guys have numbers? One through four. I think it was five, one through five. Everybody's raising their hands. He's like, okay, so what you want to do is you're, okay, so the dots are things that you're good at, that you're really good at. The numbers are what you're passionate about. So we're, we're connecting those. So you'll see on the printout what you have dots by and numbers by. That's a perfect match. You have the skills and the passion to do that job. I was the only mother trucker in that class looking really confused, really confused. And he looks and he's like, you see, I must have, because he was like, you look really confused. Are you okay over there? And I was like, yeah, I just, I don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> I don't get it. Like, I don't know if I got a, a, like, maybe you ran out of toner. So I don't have dots on certain things. I don't know. And he's like, okay. He's like, do you have dots? And I was like, yes, I have a shit ton of dots. Like the whole paper is dots. He's like, 
that's great. You have skills and all of you could do those jobs. And I was like, okay. And he was like, what about the numbers? And I was like, yeah, I have numbers, but there's no dots by the numbers. <laughs> He's like, okay, well, that that's strange. Basically, that's saying that you have a lot of skills, but you're not passionate about any of those things. <laughs> and I was like, well, where do I go for my job? The next thing we have to do is look for jobs. <laughs> He's like, well, you maybe go back to school. <laughs> maybe, learn, maybe learn a new skill. Um, but yeah, I didn't get the dots and the numbers lined up. I just realized that I was really good at a lot of things that wasn't necessarily all my passion. Like I had no, yeah, those ones I did had no dots. So I need to up my game. I need to level up. So I would tell the other people, like, look at it as an opportunity. If you need to level up, then call me. We'll figure it out together. <laughs> so you totally broke their Venn diagram. Yeah. Showed in. Yeah, so I'll, in that same breath uh you have your degree um how much do you think that's going to be useful or helpful for you in your future endeavors post-military it's not um i'm not very big in academia like i love to learn i'm probably the most curious person in the world i want to know why why you know me why why do things work this way why is it this way oh okay, let me read a book on that. <laughs> let me do the research and let me, I love learning. And I think that's what made me a really great resilience teacher as well. Um, being able to connect the dots, but learning on my own. I've read every single paper in all of the things, everything in the whole program where it was referenced, I'm looking it up and like, oh, well, what's the science behind this? And oh, what's this, like, I wanna know. But I don't have a degree in that stuff. So I don't know. I know everybody needs a degree in this world, it seems like, but I just, it's so much money and it's so much time. And it's like, I think there's so, there are also a lot of benefits to just learning and growing and being like, part of things like where you're gaining that experience and you're learning along the way. And if you're doing the work um, that is discredited, if you don't have a degree and that that's a little frustrating to me. I mean, especially with five kids in college right now. Um, Kat, she told me she graduates from UNC this year. Um, she's 21. I can't believe that. But, uh, and she was just, and she's on the fence with it. She's like, I probably won't even use this degree. You know, and it's, I think we put so much emphasis in go to college, get that degree. But do people even remember what they're getting their degree in? Do they remember doing the work? Do they remember going through the steps of it? Or if it was just an online piece of just checking the block. <laughs> so my degree um, for my associates, associates doesn't mean shit in this day and age anyway. Um, so no, I, I, it's good to have, I guess, for the, my own knowledge of, hey, this is how the body works. This is how energy works. This is the stuff you need to put in your body. This is what you need to do for your body. So those things can help me just become a better human. But as far as the job field, I don't think that's going to help me much. Are you, are you thinking, so I guess based on that answer, uh, you're not considering going back and getting a bachelor's degree or anything like that? Um, I'm on the fence. Me and my husband have been talking about it. Um, I know where I want to go as far as my passion. I want to teach. I, 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 I believe that I have a skill of connecting with others and making them think bigger and different. And everybody's telling me I need a degree to do that. I'm, I'm kind of a rebel. I want to fight the system and be like, I can do it without one and spending all that money. So I'm on the fence. I'm on the fence. Um, I'm always up for learning. I'm just not always up for having to pay for what I'm learning. <laughs> There's so many other resources out there that you can learn. Yeah, it's a lopsided system right now. Really, really lopsided. I mean, it's always been kind of lopsided, but it's really, really, really lopsided now. And it's, and it's, I ask the question because I get that, you know, polarized answers from one side to the other side. Um, and it's always been on my mind for quite a long time. 
um, to figure out like what's the cost benefit ratio of paying for college and then going into the job world afterwards. And you, you look at it and it's very, very lopsided because, you know, you spend twenty, fifty, hundred thousand dollars on college for an associate's degree. And then you go into the job world and make $27,000 a year or $37,000 a year. It just doesn't, the math doesn't make any sense. And I think, I feel like now with YouTube and with Udemy and with all these different resources that are out there, like you can literally sit down on YouTube and learn anything you want to learn. Are you going to have a degree from it? No, but um, you're also not learning to do open heart surgery on YouTube. So, you know, that's, I guess that's the, the trade off of it. Uh, yeah and that, and that's the thing it's like I, I really believe in learning I, I there's I love books anyway so I, I'm always in a book and I, I, I'm intrigued and somebody has already figured out the formula for something so why reinvent the wheel all the time um, like even my craft stuff I had no idea how to do it YouTube okay this is how you do it my biggest struggle is math and I'm like was that a fraction like what fr that I probably need more help in that I can't necessarily learn on YouTube, <laughs> but everything is there. Everything is at our fingertips. Um, I'm learning how to play the guitar. I'm learning on YouTube of, you know, there's different things and, and talking with other people, networking, networking is so important. Um, Cause you can, I can read everything all day long. It doesn't help me until I'm talking about it. And then as I'm, talking about the concepts of everything else, then like whether it's with a friend or people at Toastmasters, my husband, whatever, that's when it comes to life and those light bulbs go on of like, oh, now I'm applying this. Okay, this is how this works. It's not just regurgitating the shit. Um, so yeah, I think networking, just that connection with other people, talking about what it is that you're learning, saying it out loud. How does that work? How do you even apply that? I think that's very beneficial and it's free. Branching off of the, the education question, uh, do you feel like Toastmasters is a, a resource that regular people can use to um, better their job search, job skills, employment skills, business acumen, entrepreneurship, et cetera? Is that something that you would recommend to people? And, and can you just explain Toastmasters a little bit for people who don't really understand it fully? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I stumbled across Toastmasters uh, from a failure, actually. So I went to the resilience training, the level four course, which there are no military green suitors that are level four right now. None, like that, that the primary instructor. Um, there's in the army reserve, I think there's, well, now there's two. <laughs> there was three assistant primary instructors, me and two others. And so now there's, yeah, now there's two um, but everybody's like, yeah, hey, you need to go to this course. You'd be a phenomenal primary instructor. And it's a very, it's it, based kind of from UPenn. And so I was already feeling a little out of place. Cause I was like, okay, I'm the only green suitor. It's cool. But there was only like 10 students and they kept dropping like flies, like failing out. I think there was only like six of us left on the last day. <laughs> And it was like, well, shit. So I passed all the, the cause you do teach backs and, um, and it's, it was so interesting though. Cause it was, you got criticized on everything, which is important. It was, do you like, do you know what you look like when you're nervous? What are you, do you talk fast? Do you speed up? Do you slow down? Are you jittery? Like what's going? And so I got gigged on some of those things, but I passed, I passed everything. And then at the end of the exam, the last day they give you this 90 minute essay question exam. And I was like, holy shit, I know this stuff. Oh my God, this is what this means. And I got ahead of myself. I didn't manage my time well. And you needed an 80 to pass. And I got like a 76. So they called me in and they were just like, I know it's the last day and you completed all the work, but we're not going to graduate you. You should come back though. <laughs> You should come back and do this again. It's two weeks of just like excruciating pain. Um, and so that's how I stumbled into Toastmasters um, because I knew I wanted to go back. I looked at it as, okay, yeah, it was the exam, but I know now what I look like when I'm nervous. I don't have 
as much experience as I would like to in public speaking. So a sergeant major was like, hey, join this. I had no idea what it was. Um, but then it was it was amazing. So it, it's clubs all over the world. Um, and so ours is here in Sand Hills. And you have, it, it's like a full agenda of stuff. So you have the president of the club and they go through the agenda. You can give speeches, but everything is based off of a pathway. So you, if you become a member, you have a pathway um, like for effective coaching. Um, if you want to practice more humor and playfulness, there's like a pathway for that where you actually have to do the work and it's, it's online. It varies in time. And then you have to give a speech about it. And then the speech is, a, then you have an evaluator for your speech and they go through everything from your clarity of speech, your speed, uh, relevance to the topic, looking at the audience, were they, was the audience engaged? So those are all beneficial. And then on top of it, they do a table of topics, which is my favorite part of Toastmasters. So it's just random questions. And the Toastmaster that's giving the table topics, he'll say that he or she, they'll say the topic and then they'll call on someone. And you have, you have to speak for one to two minutes about whatever that is. And I think that is so beneficial, so beneficial, whether you're working on blocking and bridging because you have no idea what they're talking about or just bringing the best of you, filling that space. It, it gives you just more ways to think on your feet and when you're up in front of anyone. And that's been super beneficial. And then as you become more into the roles, um, and just being part of the club, like vice president of education, I'm in charge of everybody's stuff. So I'm looking at their pathway. Are they meeting their goals? What can I do to help them meet their goals? What are they trying to get out of it? Is it because they need to talk at work? Is it because they're getting ready to give a speech or I'm, we've had people give practice eulogies that they had to give, um, cause there's a lot of older people in our club too, uh, giving eulogies, giving speeches, going over presentations that they have to do. We have one that's a doctor that was speaking with the governor and she wanted to go through her information when COVID was happening. So I think it's beneficial. I think we can all up our game and just speaking. I'm definitely no expert. And you know how many times I say, um, they count your ums and all your filler words. My favorite, my, my go-to filler word is so. So, <laughs> Why do I need to say so? But I do it. So there you go. I, th I think it's fascinating. I think I've never really maybe heard it come up in a few different conversations. And when I say conversations, I mean like podcasts, reading through uh, self-help books, books about business, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, nobody really mentions it. And they've been around for quite some time. So it's not like it's a new organization and they're doing this new thing. Um, they've been doing it for many, 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 I mean, it, I think it dates back even predates Dale Carnegie, maybe, but they really, when I think about it from an abstract point of view, uh, especially for people transitioning out of the military, especially for people retiring that haven't ever done a job interview or maybe done one or two for smaller jobs. And now they're getting out, you know, as a a colonel or a, a master sergeant or a sergeant major or a CW4 or a CW3. Um, and even the ones that are getting out at, you know, E4, E5, second lieutenant, like whatever, going and doing job interviews, like I would think that the, the unintentional side effect of signing up for Toastmasters and joining and, and getting involved in it would be being able to, as you said, think on your feet and easily, easily go through an interview process with a company and sometimes multiple interview processes with a company and being able to ace the interview. And really that's the, the second big hurdle to getting into a company. Like one is getting your resume in front of people. And then once you get your resume in front of people and it's gone through the screening and it's gone through the, the, the computer system for keyword searching then you get called for the interview. The interview is the next big hurdle because if you don't pass the interview, your, your resume can look great. It could be the best resume on earth, but if you don't know how to speak to people um, and think on your feet and talk, and it's really, really crucial now because it's a lot easier to hire 
people to do jobs and there's people out there that are really laser focused on what they do and they really have the speaking skills to be able to talk. I mean, we're growing up in the generation now of TikTok and Instagram and, you know, face, Facebook, not so much, but Facebook and Snapchat and these 20 somethings have grown up with that technology. We didn't grow up with that technology. They're actively online posting videos and shorts and YouTube videos and TikToks talking to an audience daily, basically. So they've got it ingrained, you know, by default of being born in, in the, in the generation with this technology. Um, any of us in the 40, 50, 60 year old categories, <clears throat> even some of the 30 year olds didn't grow up with the internet. We didn't have all this technology. And on top of that, not a lot of us use it. I mean, we consume it, but we don't actually actively get on there and post videos and po it's hard. It's not easy to, to speak to an audience, even if it's just your phone. So I would think that that would be one way, one really kind of hack to be able to master the art of the interview process. Cause a lot of people base it on, yeah, what are the questions they're going to ask? What are some answers that you could possibly give? And that's scripted and that's fine. But what happens when they ask an offhand question and you need to answer it? And that offhand question is their criteria for whether you get in the door or not. So. And it's a, and you bring up such a good point with that. Um, you, and, and just to be clear, you don't even have to join Toastmasters. You could go as a guest to, I mean, if you Google look in your area, there's Toastmasters in every city, uh, pretty much. And if not, and a lot of them are hybrid now after COVID. So even if people wanted to do online with my club, with our club, they could do that. There's been so many people that have done exactly what you said, like, Hey, I don't know if Toastmasters is necessary for me, but I am getting out of the military. I'm preparing for an interview. Can you help me? Absolutely. Because sometimes there's holes in our agenda. Right. So it's like, fill that hole and how much, how much better can it be than just helping other people that are trying to help themselves and help the world. So, yeah. So even if they don't have to join, even they can just call up their local Toastmaster, say, Hey, is there any space on your agenda or can somebody help me go over this and get feedback from multiple people? Then I think that's great. And like, well, there's one girl in our club, even that she has cerebral palsy. She does speech contests, <laughs> you know, she's working on just really enunciating her words and trying to speak more clearly. And Kenji, my son, he started Toastmasters. He joined the club because he has Asperger's and he's not real good with people. Very good at his skills. Very, I can do this, but it doesn't go anywhere if he doesn't have that communication with other people. So it has helped him tremendously. Uh, knowing what, where he goes when he's nervous. Does he avoid eye contact? Does he, what, where is, is the audience even hearing him? How can he speak clearly? Is his intent coming across or was he off on this wild random thing? Yeah. I would almost put it on par with the, uh, cause I know they bring it up in tap the, the LinkedIn thing. Like you should go get a LinkedIn profile and you should get the LinkedIn premium and blah, 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 and set up your thing. And I, I would put Toastmasters right up there, right alongside of a LinkedIn profile, like as a tool and a resource, not so much as a, I'm doing it because it's something that I love or something. I think it's really a, one of those tools and resources that's really not so talked about. And I'm glad that, that you're part of that organization that we could talk about it a little bit. Cause I, I think it's really, really important. I think people should definitely check it out. Um, and see what it's about and just go and try it. Like that's the thing about retirement for me anyway. And probably for a lot of people is just experimenting and trying new things and throwing some stuff on the wall that could potentially stick and seeing what does stick and what doesn't stick. Um, we've got nothing but time. So. I agree. Yeah. It's a great, it's a great asset. Um, and, and it's a great way to network because everybody's coming from different places. And there might just be that one person that you talk to that has experience or that's done that before and can help mentor you or help lead you in the right direction, at least. Yeah, yeah it's definitely a way to get out of your own feedback loop uh, for sure and still get some 
super, super benefit from it. If you had a favorite book that you've gifted to many people over the years, what would that one book, what is that one book? Mm. I love books. Yeah. And that's why I threw an extra question in there because the, the regular question is not enough. <laughs> I love book. I love all books. I love, I love Brene Brown. I, I just, Ryan Holiday. Like I love books, but the way that you phrased this question, like if you could gift it to somebody, actually I started doing it as um, part of my resilience training team. Um, I would give them a book. Like I know you do the daily stoic journal. You even gave me a copy of that and that just changed my life. So you never know the impact. It might sit on the shelf for a while, but then it's like one day you dust it off and it's like, what the heck is this? This is great. So one of the things that I started doing for my training teams is I give them this book. Together is Better by Simon Sinek. I love this book. And it's all about connection, leadership. It's a little book of inspiration. It even has a page that smells like optimism. So I think that's very cool. So I give this to each member of the training team and I write something in there for them. And usually they come back and say something like it'll be a while later. They're like, oh my God, I just read that. And this is something clicks. So yeah. So this one, if I could gift it. Fantastic. Well, it sounds like you've been gifting it. That's, that's awesome. That's a really good book to gift. I, I've gifted that book a couple of times myself. It's, it's a quick read. It's not like a hard book. Anybody could read it. So if you're just starting out, try that one. Yeah. It's basically a a children's book about optimism for adults, <laughs> essentially. Uh, so on that same, same token, um, what are one to three books that have greatly influenced your choices over the years or impacted your life in a, in a massive way? Mm. Brene Brown, Gift of Imperfection, that very powerful book. I could relate to so much of it. I love when authors have a way of articulating everything that's in my brain and they just put in this beautiful language. And it's like, that's what I was trying to say. That's, I know that I, I she's brilliant. She's brilliant. Uh, so I love gifts of imperfection. All of her books are great, but that one, um, the four agreements, that one has really shaped my life a lot because it's so basic. Um, but just gentle reminders throughout the, throughout the day. And I, I always kind of lean back into the four agreements, being impeccable with my word. Don't make assumptions, you know, just all of the, just gentle reminders. And so that's, that's probably one of my go-to books. Um, hmm. I do like Mitch album books. I think um, the timekeeper, I think it was the timekeeper just makes me think. And I, I love that. So if that's more of like a, like a fun read versus just the more in-depth self-help, if you will, books, but um, those will probably be my three, but you have turned me on to Ryan Holiday. <laughs> He's brilliant. Oh my God. Just all of, all of them. So yeah, obstacles away. Uh, I'm reading the courage is calling right now. I'm almost finished with that. And those are just, there's so much history and we can learn so much from other people. And if we just look at the paths that they have already made and it, it, there's just, it, we're all connected. It's all connection. So that was more than three. Yeah, no, that's, I, I asked because I feel like there's a, I mean, there's a, a, a side question, I guess would be like, how important are mentors? Have they been in your military career? And then, outside and it could actually span your whole entire life, but how important are our mentors? And do you have one particular mentor that you would point to of yours? I'm kind of like with like to bring it back to Ryan holiday in a sense, you know, I'm kind of with him on that. It's just, it's hard to ask somebody, will you be my mentor? <laughs> Cause it's, that's so much responsibility, but start with a question, start with something. And I think that's everything that we've talked about. It's, you start with something small, you go into it. If, you, if you're curious about something, ask a question to somebody that knows more than you or something that you're interested in. That could be a mentor right there and then just following it on with another question. So I don't have like one person in particular of that I go to or that, because we're all different. 
Um, but I do ask a lot of questions to a lot of different people that have a lot more knowledge than me or just things that I'm intrigued about. And like I said, I'm very curious. <laughs> so, but I, I, I think that in the terms of mentorship, the asking the questions or, you know, asking advice, leaning in, wanting to know more, I think that's crucial. I think it's very beneficial. We, we all want to grow and we only grow by learning and we learn from other people. So I think that's, and to pay it forward with other things too, when somebody else is asking you a question, you know, lean and answer it, you know, and then they come back, like knowing that you have, they're investing their time into you. So paying it forward. I think it's on both sides. It's very beneficial and it's very crucial in order for us to grow as human beings. If you had the opportunity to invest, let's say, $10 million into something that you're deeply passionate about and that people may or may not know about, uh, what would this investment be? And of course, let's exclude um, investments for returns, but the return would be the putting something great out into the world or improving the world in some sort of way. What would that be? Mm. It's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of money. And I want to make sure it's spent the right way. <laughs> Could I like dabble in a couple things? Yes, absolutely. Um, one thing that like is completely out there, but it's just something that's been on my focus point, And actually I'm reading a book about it now is blended families. And the, there's not a lot out there. And I think, and I, I just look at just divorce rates and um, how soon people get married and marriage counseling and all the things. And I don't think there's really any support or I haven't seen any and I've been looking just community-based or whatever for connection or just understanding of how a blended family works. And um, so I would definitely put some money into that too, just because it, it's so, it's so big. It's so big and there's just so much unknown and so many feelings and so like for every single person involved. So I think there needs to be support groups or some kind of something for that. Um, I think there's already a lot of programs out there on just the mental health piece. I think it just is pushed away so if i could use that money in a way that would intrigue people and like bring people in for just different ways that they can cope how you can breathe Did, like i didn't even know nasal breathing was a thing like like um so the resources everything is out there it's just how do we get people invested how do we how do we get people to see um i think that's where i would spend my money i don't know what that is yet i've been i'm trust me it's it's working of how, how I can touch many people in an appropriate way, not an inappropriate way. <laughs> ah, like, and, and so I, I don't know what it is yet though. There's so many different things that I would put money into. Um, mental health is a huge one. Mindset, knowing how to shift your mindset. Um, but I, those things are already there. I would just be more of like, how do I get people to listen or to pay attention to it. Does that make sense? Yeah, it actually brings up an interesting point and kind of a tangent that uh, a technology tangent and it's my podcast so I can do it if I want. Um, Cause here's you, here's the world. <laughs> um, yeah, no, the, the, the tangent being what you brought up about getting mental health, getting people to come toward mental health and mental health awareness. And it's a, it's a networking problem, really. It's an onboarding problem. It's the, it's the problem that we had when credit cards were first introduced and how do you get people to use this newfangled plastic thing that they can pay with rather than cash? Cause people will know about cash and they don't understand credit cards. Same thing that happened when we did web 2.0 and we went from 
regular commerce and buying stuff in brick and mortar stores to buying things online. Like who the hell is going to buy something online and put their credit card information in to send out to the internet to get some, you know, to buy something like that was unheard of. And it was totally actually dismissed by a lot of people. Uh, but now here we are, you know, everything's ordered on Amazon. <clears throat> so the next stage of that is like web three and decentralized commerce and decentralized um, money and the technology is there. The, the framework is there. The underlying scaffolding is there, but it's again, it's that next wave of technology that's going to change the whole entire world. Like it's going to really literally change how we do commerce in the next five to 10 years. It's not going to be anything like it's now, or maybe a, a small hybrid of it, but the, the real issue right now with getting people to embrace that technology and to even understand it is the onboarding problem. And the onboarding problem seems like the big problem that we have every time we add a new layer of technology or add a new layer of consciousness. The funny thing with mental health is it's been around for, you know, since the, well, I mean, it's been around forever actually, but just recognized as a science within the last 50 to 60, 70 years through, you know, Freud and, and all these different really smart people. And so the onboarding problem hasn't been solved yet. And I think if you can figure out the way to solve the onboarding problem, then you, then, then that solves all the other problems, right? Just something to think about. It's, um, that's how I would approach it or that's how I see it. Yeah. Yeah. It's huge. And, and the world's just changing so much and ever everybody needs a, a lifeline. Yeah. But no, the world is changing so much and it's like, like a big passion for me. And as you were talking about, I guess the leveling up in the sense of how it, we're also going backwards in time and with women's rights and everything else. So if I could invest money, that would be another huge resource. It, it saddens my heart that my daughters don't have, they, they can't speak for their own bodies. And I, I think that's going to be a huge thing for mental health too. It's because how do you, how do you talk about those things? Where do they go <laughs> to, to, ha to understand, to cope, to deal with any of that. Um, so yeah, so I would definitely invest money into women as well, especially young women, young women that are figuring it out. They're just figuring it out. And then something happens and where are their resources? There needs to be more res resources for young women. Is there anything that we haven't discussed? Anything that you would like to put out to the audience or out to the world? Uh, a message, a slogan, a motto, a a quote, or just some some words of wisdom for the rest of the world, the rest of the retiring community who are either on the journey or have just recently got off the journey. Mm, I could go with my go-to of make good choices, <laughs> you know, which has followed me everywhere. Um, but honestly, it's if for the retirees and the retiree families, and first of all, I thank all of them from the bottom of my heart for all the sacrifices, everything that they have done. Um, and it sometimes it's a thankless job, but I appreciate each and every one of them um, for their contributions and their sacrifices. And I, I know it's not easy. And as they are transitioning out or the ones that have just, you're enough. That's what I would say to them. You're enough. And it's, it's, it's figure outable and you're not alone. You never are. There's always, you can, anybody can always reach out to me. I am reachable and I have nothing but time. So, um, <laughs> yeah, just they're enough. They matter. Thank you. And you're not alone. That's really good. It's a good uh, stopping point, I think. A good way to stop that you're you're enough. You're enough.
you know what people that are enough do, right? Nothing. Nothing, because they already know they're enough. So if you're doing nothing, good job. You're enough. <laughs> so if people did want to reach out to you or find you online, um, uh, where would you direct them? Um, LinkedIn or please no email because I don't want you to get bombarded with you know a million spam emails or anything like that. Yeah, my Instagram or, or Facebook, um, just sending me a message on either of those too um, is great. I'm not usually on those as much, but I, li I, I go through my messages. So I do check my messages on there. Um, mostly it's just to look at crafting stuff and, and cat videos because I have time to do that now and painting goats because they're hilarious. Um, but yeah, Instagram and Facebook is probably the best way they want to reach out and then they can just see a little tidbit of my life too. And all the crazy chaos that makes me, me. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. We'll go ahead and get those uh, links and throw them in the show notes. And um, yeah, I, I definitely want to be responsible with your time and uh, we've definitely covered a whole lot of topics and a whole lot of subjects. And I appreciate you and thank you very, very, sincerely for spending the time with me today for these couple hours to to sit down and go over this stuff there's a lot of important things that we talked about and a lot of really uh, deeper explanations about things that people should be aware of when they're getting to retirement transition any kind of conversion from one state to the other state so thank you thank you thank you for setting all this up i mean it's your ear blessing to help others and another resource for them to see that one, that they're not alone <laughs> and just all the tidbits of information as well. And if you need help too, I do have time. So if you want to, we can start a book of all the things you missed. Could be a good toilet reader, you know, like all the things you thought you knew in case you get hit by a bus, like here's that folder, like in a hard copy of all the information that is not in these books. So if you need help with that, let me know. But no, thank you. I appreciate you reaching out to everybody and just getting more input and more answers. And just thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's what it's all about is making the information more available. We've talked about that in many different facets of this conversation. So, so for everyone out there on the internet, all of you, 42 people. Uh, thank you for spending the time with us today and watching and any information we talked about, any of the things that we discussed will be down in the show notes, any of the links. Um, feel free to reach out to Stacy. She's her DMS are open for now um, until she gets bombarded with DMS and until next time. Uh, thanks everybody for being here. It's wonderful to be able to serve you and have a great day.